I, by the grace of God, we are all able to be here tonight. I'm excited about being here tonight to fellowship with you, uh, to be a part of this great series. Thank you for the introduction and um, for uh, having me to come again. I'm always excited to come uh, to the uh, Highland Heights Church uh, and to be reacquainted with many of you who have had the blessing to get a chance to know. There's a lot to say when you've been in a community for 30 years. I never would have thought that I would have been uh, in Lebanon, Wilson County, for 30 years, but it's been a blessing. I found my wife here. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and my son grew up, he's back there in the back, and my nephew's now with him, but it's been great to be acquainted and to reacquaint myself with many of you who are here in our great community. Uh, so uh, thank you again for inviting me to come and be a part uh, of this great summer series. Um, I um, uh, want to try to, I'm looking for your clock. Where's, there it is, right there, okay. Looking for your clock. Tonight, um, my dear brother said we're excited about uh, the subject matter. How many of you are really excited about it? Just be honest. Just got a few people, okay. It's a subject that has been given to me that uh, is very uh, contemporary, very uh, needed, very prevalent. But I would tell you, to be honest with you, it's not something I just enjoy uh, talking about um, uh, because it, it pulls back, exposes the ills of our society. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, we're in the 21st century. We got some younger people and we, we love you. We, we're looking forward to you to help us uh, go forth in the future. But uh, uh, we live in the greatest nation um, on the face of this earth. Amen. The greatest nation, I'm going to say that twice, the greatest nation. And if you have not been outside of the United States, you don't know. It's the greatest nation. On, I've, been, I've had the blessing of being able to go different places. And, uh, but when you go and you end up finding people uh, who do not have the, uh, are able to enjoy uh, just the little simple things that we enjoy, we take it for granted. It is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. I believe that is the case because of the fact uh, there are people here uh, who believe in God. And it's not because you're Republican or Democrat or Independent, none of that. It's because of our faith, our trust, our confidence that is in God. And the more that we continue to trust God, I think the stronger our nation will become. The less we trust God and know about God, the weaker we will be. And uh, it will be um, deplorable. Tonight, the subject that's been given to me uh, as we've talked about this great series, summer series, um, uh, The Church in a Chaotic World, uh, the scripture that's been given to me is uh, Colossians chapter number 3 uh, and verses number 11. Now tonight, uh, I don't know if you all have the ability to put scripture on the screen or not, or you may not be prepared, but if you don't have your Bible, I'm, 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 I'm the last of the baby boomers, so I, I, know, I know you younger preachers have the, the apps and all that, but I still carry the King James or King Jimmy. Um, I'm old school, um, and I almost had a little uh, problem tonight because I got ready to print my little notes and my printer wouldn't work. Uh, but anyway, I have to rely on, so tonight, uh, whether or not you're able to have a PowerPoint or be able to look at the scripture, uh, I'm going to just do something that I grew up doing, and that is simply Bible study. Is that okay? I'm not an anthropologist. I am a diversity consultant. I've trained uh, companies and corporations around uh, the country regarding diversity, but I'm not here tonight as a diversity consultant. I'm here tonight as a gospel preacher. And so we're going to go to the Word of God to look at this uh, subject tonight, uh, the Christian and racism. There are prim three primary scriptures that I want to look at. I want to look at Colossians chapter 3 and verses number 11. Uh, uh, verses number 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. I don't know if that could be on the screen or not, but if you will look at your uh, Bible app, Colossians chapter number 1. Uh, chapter number three, rather, verses number one through verses number 11. 
Now, being a gospel preacher, what I like to do, as I was saying to you earlier, uh, I, 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 want to, I want to look at what God says about the Christian and racism. Now, uh, the church is a microcosm. What do you mean by that, Brother Johnson? The church is a microcosm of the world. The church is a microcosm of the community. Whatever is in the world, you're going to find it, guess where? In the church. Whatever is in the community, you're going to find it in the church. You need some Bible for that, don't you? Okay. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. But 1 Corinthians, the church at Corinth was... Um, uh, uh, um, a church that was in the city of Corinth, and Corinth was known for its sex, fornication, pornography. It was known for it. It had a temple, and its priests, or pre or its its uh, it had prostitutes to serve as their priests. And so when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes and says there, we don't have to go there right now, but he says, you know, to the church at Corinth, there's some things going on in the church at Corinth that's not even named amongst those who are Greeks of the heathens. What's the point you're making? Whatever is in the city or in the community, you're going to find it Where? Y'all not going to hit me here tonight. You're going to find it in the church. And that's a classic example. I might have taught you this but before I came to Lebanon. I used to be in Lynchburg. I might have shared this. I used to be in Lynchburg, Tennessee. I preached there about six years. What's Lynchburg known for? Tennessee, I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. It's known for its alcohol. It's known for Jack Daniels. And so I preached there for six years. Six years. And preaching there for six years, what do you think... I found even when I went into people's homes, Jack Daniels. And not, not, that, not that they drank Jack Daniels, but they worked there. And whether or not you could, we can debate whether or not it's right for them to work or not, but they worked there and they took home souvenirs and, and people who worked in the school system. If you worked in the school system in Moore County, most of the money, the dollars that were paying for the school system for teachers came from money from Jack Daniels. So when I went to Lynchburg, I went in to visit some of the members of the church. They would invite me over to eat. I would go to eat. Uh, I would go into the house to eat. Uh, sometime I would spend the night, and I was single then. And uh, one of the uh, members of the church told me, in a, um, uh, uh, he, he says, now, preacher, uh, you're going to spend the night. You're in the, you're in the guest back bedroom back there. But now, don't mess with my liquor. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Well, he had received some contem co commemorative uh, bottles and uh, it was in the bedroom and he didn't drink but that just was the common place in Jack Daniels in, in, in Lynchburg. What's the point you're making Johnson? I'm telling you that whatever you find in a community you're going to find it in the church. If you go to Las Vegas you're going to find people in Las Vegas, in the church, who have a gambling problem. Yes, because the church is a microcosm of the community. If I would ask the question, what would you find in Lebanon? Don't shout out loud. <laughs> but it is a microcosm of the community. And so... Um, if that's the case, then whatever ills that are in the community or in the world, you're going to find it in the church. Amen. Amen. Number two, um, let's, let's define a few words before we get into the scripture. Uh, prejudices, stereotypes, and discrimination. Okay? We are all prejudiced. I 
I said we are all. Yes, you are. The word prejudice simply means you prejudge. We automatically attach that word to race. But we prejudge a lot of stuff. We prejudge men, we prejudge women. Women, we prejudge men. We, we, we have prejudices about people from the north. They have prejudices about people from the south. Y'all not feeling this, are you? <laughs> yes, you have prejudices. I have prejudices. All of us have. We prejudge. We prejudge. Prejudices in them themselves are not wrong because all of us have these kinds of, of, of we, we prejudge. The problem, though, many times the prejudges, though the prejudices we have are many times based on ignorance and based on fear. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't understand you. I don't know why y'all say Lebanon instead of Lebanon. We prejudge. I have a good friend of mine. He's a preacher. He's from New York. Some of y'all from, from Peyton Road are here. Y'all probably know who I'm talking about. And, and he's a good friend of mine, but he's from New York. And he would come down, and we're good friends, and he would talk real fast. Just, 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 he's a preacher, just real fast. And he had some kind of prejudice to think that everybody from the South who talks slow are not intelligent. And so I had to educate him very quickly. We all have prejudices. But prejudices, when we begin to, when we have prejudices and we then begin to stereotype people and say all women, all men, all blacks, all whites, all Asians, and we begin to categorize them with these prejudices, we stereotype people. We stereotype them. That all women do this. All men, okay? And those of us, especially in the Churches of Christ, ought to be able to identify with this because even religiously speaking, people categorize members of the Church of Christ. All of us do what? All of us believe this. And you know that's not totally true. Prejudices, stereotypes, then we move, and this is what we don't want. When you stereotype people, you then begin to treat them differently. And that's what we call discrimination. Are y'all following me? When you treat someone based on those stereotypes or those prejudices. Now, tonight, um, what does that got to do with the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. The, the scripture uh, you gave to me was Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 11. I'm going to read verse number 11. Here's what it says. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I can give you some statistics about the rise of racism in America. But I don't think I need to do that tonight. I don't think I have to do that. And quite frankly, I'm not here to talk about racism in the society. That's not even my topic. I'm here to talk about the Christian and racism, okay? So when you read the Bible, contextually speaking, Matthew, Mark, and John, the gospel, design, life of Jesus, helping us to be able to, to, be, to be believers that he's the son of God, and then we come to the book of Acts, that is the book of conversion, to help us to, help us to obey the gospel and respond and to be added to the church and to become Christians. Now, when you get from Acts and you begin to look at the letters of Paul, Paul and Peter and John, those letters are not written to the world. They're not written to the unbeliever. Check it out. 
They are written to the saved. They are written. When Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he's writing to the church. He's not writing to Washington. He's not... Check it out. He's writing to us because we are the disciples of Christ. And the Great Commission is for us to go into the world, teach and preach and live a life that exemplifies that we've been born again. And as a result of that, it would help the church or help the world look to Jesus. And as a result of them looking to Jesus, they too will say, I want to change and be like Jesus. I think today we have, and I'm not trying to beat up on preachers, but a lot of people don't understand the context and the purpose of the Bible. It's not just a handbook. It's New Testament is, 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 is to help people. The gospel, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I declare to you the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. But once we obey the gospel, we have to then live out the gospel. It's not enough just to believe. You also have to behave. Are you following me? If you do not behave, if your behavior is not coinciding with your belief, well, that's what's called a hypocrite. And that's the reason why sometimes our uh, Islamic friends would like to refer to Christianity or as Christians as infidels who really don't believe. So we have the charge of not just becoming a Christian, but we have to live a Christian lifestyle. We have to have beliefs, we have to have behavior. And so Paul writes to the church at Corinth or church at Colossa. And it's one of his four prison epistles. And he writes to them. And when you look at the context of verse number 11, you read verse number 11 where he says, neither Greek nor, uh, uh, neither Greek nor Jew. But if you read above it very quickly, I'm looking at my time, very quickly, I want to give you a quick outline uh, that you can, be able to, you can be able to understand what Paul is trying to say in these 11 verses. First of all, um, number one, uh, Paul says in verse one, if you then been raised, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Again, he's not talking to the unbeliever. He's writing and talking to the saved at Colossa. And he's saying, if you were raised with Christ, you would be seeking. First point I'm making is we got to seek the heavenly. The characteristic of a Christian is we're going to seek the heavenly. We're going to be seeking those things which are above. Those things which are above. What do you mean those things which are above? He says, where Christ is. Well, where is Christ? In Ephesians 3, we find out Christ is in the heavenlies on the right-hand side of the Father. That's where Christ is. He's in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1, 3, I preached about it Sunday. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ and they are in the, heavenly, in the heavenlies. That's the third heaven. Spiritual blessings are not the same as physical blessings. I'm going to get to the race part just in a moment. But spiritual blessings. He's not talking about a BMW. He's not talking about a house on a hill. Those are physical things. Paul is saying spiritual blessings are in Christ. And they are, the way you obtain them, you've got to get into the heavenlies. It makes, the heavenlies. Amen. Because that's where Christ is is. That's where Christ is right now. He's our mediator interceding for us. So you've got to seek the heavenlies. Seeking those things which are above. Stay with me. I'm going to be where you want to be just a moment. Not only do you need to seek the heavenly, but number two, you need to set your mind on things above. Seek 
set. Once you are seeking, looking, grasping, acquiring things that are above the heavenlies, then you need to set your mind because the truth of the matter is, is this, brothers and sisters, the devil is trying to attack your faith, which is really your mind. And when you begin to talk about isms, they have to deal with how one thinks. That's where it's at. Well, we, if we could just change people's behavior. You cannot change people's behavior until, first of all, you change their thinking. Yes, we've had all kinds of laws, civil rights laws and marches, and, and they were designed, yes, to change the law, and I believe in that. But you can change a law, but that ain't going to necessarily change somebody's thinking. If I don't like you, no law, y'all not going to help me here. Is going to change that. Well, we'll just sue them. Well, I'm not saying don't. Fred Gray, Attorney Fred Gray, member of the church, elder in the church, dear friend of mine, just received the award from, from our press. He told me, listen, a lawsuit may be good and fine, but it's not going to change people's thinking. Only thing that's going to change someone's thinking is they have to change it, but God has to help them change. Whether you're talking about race, whether you're talking about poverty, whether you're talking about whatever, money, God has to help us with that. Set your mind. So seeking, setting, and then thirdly, verses number 5 through 11, you've got to slay some things. Three words, seeking, setting, slay. You've got to kill some things. Where do you get that at? Look at verse number 5. It says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, right? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the, he's talking to the church. He's talking to the church. He's talking to you and me. Put to death. You've got to slay some things. You've got to put aside some things. Well, Brother Johnson, I was baptized. Well, maybe you were baptized, but just because you are convinced doesn't mean you are converted. I'm going to say that again. Just because you're convinced does not mean you are converted. Third time's a charm. Just because you are convinced I know a lot of people who say they're convinced about God, but they're not converted to God. And I'm going to show you just in a minute an example. If you need some more Bible, you go to Luke chapter 22, and, 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 and Jesus had to, tell, had to tell Peter, when you are converted. Now, he was an apostle. Amen. A lot of people are convinced but they're not converted fully to Jesus. Well, they were baptized. Everybody baptized, not converted. Some folk get baptized because in order to marry this girl, the daddy said, we ain't let, you're not getting baptized until you get in that water. We're not going to let you marry them until you get in that water. Y'all ain't never heard of the wedding. And so the young man wants to marry that young girl, so what do you think he's going to do? Come down and get in the water. Was he converted to Jesus? Maybe, maybe not, but more than likely, he wanted to get married, and he knew that you were not going to approve the marriage. Convinced, but not converted. And by the way, baptism does not wash away everything. It washes away sins, but it doesn't wash away attitudes. It doesn't wash away mindsets. It just doesn't. If I'm a mean, mad, miserable person, baptism ain't gonna wash it away. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get in the word and I've gotta let God and his Holy Spirit work with me to help change my mindset. And that's why Paul is even having to say this to the church at Corinth. 
He tells them that uh, put to death some things. Okay? And then he goes on to say here, but now he says, uh, look here, uh, you need to, two things. You need to, you need to, you need to, verse number eight, but now you yourselves are to put off these things. And I got to hurry up because of my time. He says in verse number eight, put off some things. And then in verse number 10, he says, you got to put on some things. And I was going to illustrate that tonight. I was going to come with an old coat and, and, and just show you an old coat, old with holes in it, and take it off and put on a new. That's really the idea. He says, if you are risen with Christ, then you ought to put off. We should have put off. And he's not literally talking about clothes. He is saying the old Adamic man, the old man that's unregenerated, the old man that is sinful, the old man that only uh, wants to concentrate with old kinds of thinking, you've got to take that off and put on put on some new things, the new man. Notice what he says in verse number 10. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. The new. The Greeks had interesting two words to talk about newness. Newness. Um, this word new uh, talks about time. You should put on in time a new man who is renewed, and that word renew deals with quality. What's the idea? The idea is, is that I put off the old man in time, and I need to constantly be renewing quality, the new man, the new person who is in Jesus. How do I do that? Look what he says. Renewed in knowledge. In knowledge. The way I renew my mind, I, I get a better mind, is not by, and nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with watching news and all that, but news, if you want news, whether you're talking about CNN, Fox, MSN, it'll make you mad. Make you angry. And in some cases, it will just uh, solidify mindsets of the world that we once had. Now, Brother Johnson just told me not to, not to I, what I'm telling you is Paul says we need to renew our mind in what? Knowledge. In knowledge. That's what the Bible says. In knowledge. In knowledge. According to the what? Image of him who created him. We want to we know more about Jesus. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus live down here amongst a lot of the ills they had at that time. Uh, now then he says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Quickly. Now, in the Greco roman world, uh, uh, cultural um, racism and isms are not new. They were existing. They existed even in the time of Jesus. Quickly. Let me just share it with you. Uh, my time is moving. I've got to share it. I'm gonna get to, he says, he says, neither Greek nor Jew. Uh, the Greek and Jews was a great separation. Jews, first of all, felt they were better than Greeks. John chapter 4, read it when you get home. Jesus meets a woman at the, at the well and asks for, for, for some water. She said, if you only knew that, you know, I'm a Samaritan, if you only knew who I was, you know that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You never read that. Read it. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. A Samaritan was considered a half-breed, a mulatto. Jews, have, Jews believe where either you are a full Jew or you know Jew. When you read the Old Testament, it says, you know, when he talks about uh, one, of the, one of the commandments, love thy neighbor as, okay? Well, neighbor, they interpret that as nearby. That's what it means, nearby. Love my, whoever's nearby me. Well, who's nearby me? My cousin, my brother, my auntie. But anybody who's not nearby me, I don't have to love. And that was the attitude of Jews. Mindset. Hello? And Jesus had to deal with that. Well, uh, quickly, as my time wraps, I want to give you two quick scriptures, uh, and then uh, the lesson will be yours. Uh, can I, would, would, and, and Christianity, Christians should not be racist. Now, I'm going to give you an example of somebody who was, though, in the Bible. Y'all ready? 
Okay, let's go to, I got three scriptures. I got to hurry and get through this. Uh, first scripture, uh, let's go to uh, Acts chapter number 10. Acts 10, write these scriptures down. Acts chapter 10. This man was an apostle. His name was Peter. I'm talking about some, you got to slay some things. His name was Peter, Acts chapter 10. And I have to hurry through this. Verses number 1 all the way down uh, to verses number 14. Peter, you know, Peter was, uh, was, was a Jew, and he went to the household of Cornelius. God sent him to Cornelius, who was an Italian or Gentile. And Cornelius, or Peter, had some, some issues. He had some, he had some cultural, he had some race issues. He did not want to deal with Cornelius. He didn't even think Cornelius was worth being saved. Cornelius, in verses number one through verses number uh, three, he sends, and he sends people down uh, to where Cornelius, where Peter was, uh, to try to get the man of God's attention. Uh, verses number one through verses number eight. You come down to verse number nine. The Bible says the next day as, the, as they went on their journey, he drew, drew near the city. Peter went up to the house top to pray about the sixth hour. God has to teach him something. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opening and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him, let down to the earth. In it, all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, said, Rise, Peter, kill or slay and eat. God is trying to teach the man something. But Peter said this, Not so, Lord, for I have not never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice came back to him the second time. God had to tell Peter, let me tell you something, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. What's the issue? Peter, you're having problems with that attack. You're having problems with Cornelius. You don't think he's worthy. You think he's common. You think he's just, and God says, what I've cleansed, don't you call it common or unclean. Last scripture, all right? A little stronger than this one. Go to Galatians 2, verses number 11. Quickly, as I close. Galatians 2, verses number 11 and verse number 14. I hope you'll write these scriptures down. These are just the examples of why a Christian should not be. And Peter, who was an apostle, Peter, who was an apostle, was guilty of it. In Galatians 2, verse number 11, now when Peter had come to Antioch, Paul is writing this now, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Huh? Because he was to be blamed. Well, what was he doing? For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. Peter's a Jew, and Jews have no dealings with Gentiles. But now this is in the Christian dispensation, and Peter is still doing it. And Paul says, I had to confront him. Why? Because he was to be blamed, because he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, Jews, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, the Jews. He was afraid what other Jews might say because he's over here with these Gentiles. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. It wasn't just Peter. Other Jews were doing it. Not only other Jews, so that even Barnabas, underlying that, Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Paul is writing, do you not know that it was Barnabas who gave Paul the right hand of fellowship? Imagine this, the person who helped convert you to Christ is caught up in that? Yeah. So what, what's, what's, what, 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 what do you do about that? Peter says, I had to go to them, and I had to confront them, and I had to tell them. Uh, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as uh, the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? As I close, what's the point you're making? We see examples 
What's the point? Those of us who are Christians, we have to slay some things. We got to work on it. Amen. And just in case you think I'm talking just to white people, there are black people who have issues too. You can take a deep breath. Amen. Yeah. And it's going to stay in the world. It's going, to, it's going to be prominent in the world. And here's my point. It's going to be in the world, but it should not be in the church. And I didn't say in the church building. When we leave this assembly tonight and we go to work tomorrow, we take Christ with us. And we should take those attitudes that are demonic, unhealthy, unchristian, and we need to work on slaying them. Not just getting quiet, not just being quiet, so I ain't gonna say anything because I don't want to know. As a child of God, I have to do like Paul. I have to speak up. My time is gone a couple of years ago year and a half ago, I had the great privilege of meeting with not only members of the church or preachers of the Church of Christ in Lebanon during the George Floyd era. We met about, hmm, gosh, we met about over the summer. Uh, and then I also met with preachers who were not Churches of Christ. And we had some good discussions. And they said, tell me, Help me. And I said, I will if we want to be honest now. We have to be honest because we cannot ever go forward if we got blinders on and we don't think it's not existing. My conversation to the church people were different from the non-church to some degree because those of us who are saved, we have the banner and the responsibility of not just knowing Christ, but living a life of a Christian. It's not just what we believe, it's how we behave. And that's how we'll change our community. And that's how we'll change our world. Tonight I'm looking for, is this the invitation time or do I, looking for, not yet, okay. All right, thank you.